Hi, welcome back. We've now finally left the singular value decomposition section of the course, and we're now going to move into error correcting codes, which is um, a topic in the mathematical field of coding theory. It also has very close ties to computer science. And it's a very interesting topic, totally separate from what we've done so far. Okay. So in order to understand some coding theory, we first need to introduce vector spaces over finite fields. Okay, so a natural question is what, what the heck is a finite field, right? Now a field is just a set, you can think of it as a set of numbers that have two operations, an addition and a multiplication with lots of nice properties. Okay, so for example, there's an additive identity, which you usually call a zero. Addition is commutative and associative. Multiplication is commutative and associative. There's a multiplicative identity. There's a distributive property, but in particular, in a field, you can divide by any number, right? Any non-zero number in particular. Every non-zero element has a multiplicative inverse. Okay, it's basically the nicest kind of set that you can think of. So the most important examples are R and C. Right, Those have a plus and a times, and every non-zero real number has an inverse. Every non-zero complex number has an inverse. Right, the, um, Also the rational numbers. But if you look at the set of integers, um, that is not a field because uh, two and three and four don't have multiplicative inverses. Okay, and a thing that um, is true, and you learn maybe in like math 340, is that you can do linear algebra over any field, and basically all of the same things are true. Okay, so fact, you can do linear algebra over any field. Okay, so when you first learn linear algebra, you learn it over the real numbers. That's your base field, that's your scalar field. And you learn about matrices, you learn about null spaces, column spaces, spans, all these things. It turns out that you can replace R with any field. And we've sort of looked a little bit at what happens if you let your field be C, but you can also do it over the rationals. You can do linear algebra over the rationals. And you can do linear algebra over finite fields, which are the ones that we're going to introduce right now. Okay, so a finite field is going to be a field with a finite number of elements. Okay, of course, these three are all infinite fields. They have infinitely many elements. And so they behave a certain way. And finite fields, because they're finite, um, behave like a little bit differently than your intuition would imagine, right? So for example, over a finite field, like a subspace can have finitely many elements, like a one-dimensional subspace can have finitely many elements, right? Whereas over R or over C, a one-dimensional subspace is like a line. It contains infinitely many vectors. That won't be true over a finite field. But still, you can do all of linear algebra. You can talk about matrices, null spaces, column spaces, spans, linear independence. All that stuff still works over any field. Okay, so the example of a finite field that we're going to start with is one that we've talked about a little bit, which is uh, Z mod five, Z five, right? So this has elements zero, one, two, three, four, and you add them and you multiply them by taking the remainder after dividing by five, right? Oftentimes these are denoted with bars, right? But let's just suppress the bar notation. But we should know that really these you can think of these as equivalence classes of integers. Right? And so the point is that like you know, two plus four equals one because the remainder after you divide by five is one. And another way to say this is that two plus four is congruent to one mod five. And the way that you can tell that two numbers are uh equivalent modulo five is whether their um difference is a multiple of five. Really, okay, you know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna include the bars to to make a difference. This equality is in Z mod five. 
So 2 plus 4 is not equal to 1, but 2 bar plus 4 bar is equal to 1 bar. Okay, and there's of course a very natural addition and multiplication operation. But if I write down uh, the multiplication table, what I'll see is that actually every single uh, element of Z5 has a multiplicative inverse. Right, why is that? Every non-zero element, I should say. Well, 1 times 1 is 1, so 1 is its own multiplicative inverse. That's actually true in any field. 2 times 3 is 1, so therefore 2 and 3 are each, um, they're multiplicative inverses of one another. And 4 times 4 is 1. That's really because 4 is, <laughs> 4 is negative 1, right? So of course, negative 1 times negative 1 will equal 1. This is true in any field as well. So Z5 is a field. Because every element has a multiplicative inverse, and there's an addition and a multiplication, and they play nice together. Okay, so you can, you can of course, Google or Wikipedia field to see the axioms. They're not super duper complicated. It's just we don't need to worry about them because these will satisfy all of those axioms. Okay, uh, non-example. You can take Z6, right, which has six elements in it, and the point is, is that two doesn't have a multiplicative inverse here. Why? So like two times two is four, that's not one. Of course, two times one is two, that's not one. Two times three is zero, that's not one. Two times four is two, that's not one. And two times five is 10, that's four, that's not one, right? So these are not equal to one. So two does not have a multiplicative inverse, two bar. So sometimes these Z ends will be fields and sometimes not. And it's not so hard to show that this happens that uh, you'll be able to get a field if and only if uh, the integer you're taking the module with respect to is prime. So I'll just state that as a fact here. Zn is prime, sorry, is a field. If and only if n is prime. Right, uh, of course, I'm, here I'm saying that you can define the integers modulo n for any n greater than or equal to 2. Okay, I think the notes are actually slightly wrong here. They say that you can take Zn for any integer. Uh, you kind of can if you take further mathematics. And like Z, Z minus 2 is the same thing as Z2. So, But when you learn it first, I think you only learn define it for integers n greater than or equal to 2. It, the notes also say that Z1 is Z, but uh, I disagree with that. I think Z1 is, is not Z. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, right? The point is that you know about... Uh, arithmetic modulo n, and we'll have a nice supply of fields to do linear algebra over because each of these, when when n is prime, gives you a field. And now you can do linear algebra over z5. But actually the most important one, in some sense, the, the one that's used the most often, is z mod 2. Right? z mod 2 is just two elements, 0 bar and 1 bar. And you can think of the equivalence classes when you're constructing z2, as being all the even numbers and all the odd numbers, right? Um, so we fully understand addition and multiplication uh, in this field, right? So, I mean, this one is so small that I could just write down all the additions and all the multiplications. And, you know, it's all the same rules that you're used to. Of course, I don't need to write this one down because addition is commutative. So let's not write that one down. Or maybe, maybe I'll write it here. So, like, well, I don't need to include that one, and then 1 plus 1 is zero, right? And again, it's just because you, when you divide by two, the remainder you get is always one or zero. Or another way to read these things is the first one says that an even plus an even is even. The second two say that an even plus an odd is odd. And the last one says that an odd plus an odd is even, right? So you've probably known that since elementary school and you can, it basically is just the addition table for, for Z mod two. Okay, similarly, we can write down just the multiplication table. 0 times 0 equals 0. 0 times 1 equals 1 times 0 equals 0. It's true in every field that when you multiply by 0, you get 0. And then 1 times 1 equals 1. 
And so every non-zero number has a multiplicative inverse. There's only one non-zero number, and it's its own multiplicative inverse, right? Now, so Z2 is a field. So let's do some linear algebra over Z2. OK, so the field is the thing that you take the scalars from, right? So our scalars will be 0 bar and 1 bar. OK, and from here on out, I'm going to suppress the bars because writing, if, I'm, if I want to write a vector with zeros and ones in it, and I put a bar over everything, I think it'll only make it worse. So from here on out, we're going to assume that we're working in Z2, and 0 means 0 bar, and 1 means 1 bar. OK, so henceforth, in the rest of this lecture anyway, maybe the next couple, we work in Z2. So what are, the, what are some vector spaces over Z2? Well, the ones that you should first think about is just like over R, we thought about Rn. We should think about Z2n, which will be n tuples of scalars from Z2. So the first one to think about, I guess, is, I guess, Z2 cubed, Z2 3. What is this defined to be? This is a set of all uh, ordered triples uh, a, B, C, or yeah, you could write it as a column vector if you want, where A, B, and C are from Z2. Right? This is just the same definition as R3 if you replace the Z2 with R. But now this is a finite field, so there's only finitely many triples. We can actually write all of them down. Right? So 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. 0, 1, 1, uh, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, 1, right? And hopefully you can see that like uh, base 2 is very closely related to Z2, right? right? Um, we can even sort of visualize Z2 to the n, because if we think of these as integers, we could graph them, right? And the point is that uh, like z2 squared, if I think of these as integers, they're not. But if I think of them and I graph them, it's like 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. It's like the corners of a, of a square. And if I think of. Uh, this one, it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0. Uh, it's like the, uh, the corners of a cube in, in R3. Uh, OK, let me just connect them with solid lines. Right. So you can think of this as, you can visualize it as corners of a unit cube. And so this is sometimes useful, and this is sometimes how you actually think about these things. This works for any dimension n. The elements of z2 to the n can be pictured as like the corners of an n-dimensional hypercube in Rn, the unit one. OK, but um, the point is, is that this is a vector space. That means you can add and you can scale or multiply. You can take linear combinations, right? So adding just happens component-wise. Scalar multiplication happens, you multiply all the way through. There's just only two scalars that you can take, right? So I can take linear combinations of these things, right? I can take, uh, oops, I didn't mean to hit that twice, alpha 0, 0, 1 plus beta 1, 1, 1 will be beta, beta, alpha plus beta. And here, of course, alpha and beta can only take on two values. So like if beta and alpha were both one, right, then this would be 
1, 1, 0. Or alpha could be 0 and beta could be 1, or alpha could be 1 and beta could be 0. Um, and all you need for a vector space is to be is to contain the zero vector. We have zero, zero, zero. To be closed under addition, to be closed under multiplication, and to satisfy a bunch of nice properties. And those nice properties are true because z two is a field, right? So like if you add, I mean, addition of vectors is commutative because addition inside of the field was commutative. So you needed the you need the, the scalar field to have very nice properties. Okay, and of course, right, like z to the fourth, same thing. It's just all ordered four tuples. Um, and how many elements are in this thing? Well, you have four entries, each of which can take any of two values. So there's two to the fourth elements. This thing has two to the fourth vectors in it. And in general, you can define z two to the n, and it contains two to the n vectors. OK, you can also have things like subspaces. So let me just uh, talk about the one-dimensional subspaces here. A one-dimensional subspace should be the span of a single non-zero vector, right? But if you take the span of a single non-zero vector over z2, you're just multiplying by 0 or you're multiplying by 1, right? So let, let's, again, work back in z2 cubed. So if I take like the span of 0, 0, 1, say, that means take all linear combinations of 0, 0, 1. That means take every scalar multiple of 0, 0, 1. So the span here is just the 0 vector and 0, 0, 1 itself. But this thing is closed under addition, and it's closed under scalar multiplication. Therefore, this thing is a subspace. And if you think about it, like uh, this thing should be like a line. Well, what is a line? A line should look like z2 to the 1, which has two elements in it. So all the lines in uh, a vector space over z2 will have two elements, the 0 vector and one non-zero vector. A two-dimensional subspace should look like z2 squared, right? A plane will be four points. In fact, you know, let's let's just do it. Do a plane here. So I take any non-zero vector, and now I need to take any non-zero vector that's not in the span that should determine a plane. So I don't know if I take this one here. What do I need to do? I need to take all possible linear combinations of these things. So you can get zero by scaling by zero. You get, of course, these vectors themselves by taking one of one and zero of the other. And then you can also add them together to get one, zero, zero. And it turns out that if you take a look at this set and you scale and multiply and you add, you're, clo you're always closed under addition and you're closed under scale and multiplication. This thing has a, a basis of two linearly independent vectors. This thing is a plane in Z2 cubed. So this is a plane or a two-dimensional subspace. And again, it looks like Z2 squared. It has four elements in it because Z2 squared is like a plane, right? A two-dimensional plane. Okay, so this is the background. The point is just we can do linear algebra where every entry of every vector is 0 or 1 because Z2 is a field. Okay, but now I want to talk about the Hamming code. Okay, and the idea behind coding theory is how can I efficiently transmit messages over a channel that could possibly introduce some error. So I want to uh, send messages in some kind of smart way where the error in the, uh, the potential error in the transmission process doesn't change my message. Okay, so for, and almost always when you're talking about coding theory, 
you convert your message to binary, right? So like maybe you have, uh, you devote five bits to every letter, right? Because there's 32 five bits strings and there's uh, 26 letters. And then you send uh, each letter as a five bit binary string. So almost always when you do, for encoding theory, you're sending binary strings, which means that you're working over Z2 in, in, some, in some sense. Okay, so suppose we want to transmit a message V as a string of, as a binary string. So the example in the notes is maybe V is 1011. Okay, and suppose that there is a small chance of error when transmitting each each bit. Okay, so generally what you assume is that there's some chance of, of transmitting error, but there's a pretty low chance of transmitting many errors. Right? Of course, for example, if your um, transmission system at a 50% error rate, then any message you get would essentially be garbage, right? Because if it has a 50% error rate, then if, if you get a one, there's an equal chance that it was a zero or a one. So getting the one tells you basically nothing. So usually you imagine that the error rate is like, I don't know, 10%. So there's a reasonable chance that any one of them might be flipped, but the chances that a lot of them are flipped is, is relatively low, right? So, so it's by small chance here, I mean, Think like 10% or something like that, 5%, something where if you if you get a message, there's a reasonable chance that you'll have some small number of errors, but not a lot of errors. It turns out that if uh, you have like a 90% error rate, that's the same thing as a 10% error rate because you could just flip them all. So error rates really only make sense up to 50% anyway. Okay, so let's just assume that the chance of many errors is very small. But there's some chance, there's a reasonable chance of one error. Or you could be more general and say, suppose there's a reasonable chance of getting k errors in a, if I'm sending four bits at a time. So there's, there's a, maybe there's a reasonable chance of getting two errors, but the chance of getting three errors is very small. Okay. Now, when you send this message, your friend who you're sending it to might get so you might receive the message one zero zero one say, All right? There's there's one error. The third the third bit flipped. And the question is, how do you design a system to make sure that your friend gets the same message? I mean, the correct message. Okay, one thing you could do is you could send the message many many times, right? Send it ten times, and then because there's a low chance of error, you can just look at each of the ten messages, and then. For each position, you see what was the thing I got the most, right? I, I got like nine ones and a single zero. That means that that bit was probably a one, etc. But sending a message 10 times means you take up 10 times the bandwidth of sending it once. So the, the idea behind one of the questions of coding theory is how do I efficiently communicate messages over a channel that might have errors by not... <laughs> taking up a huge amount of bandwidth, but still having some high confidence that I can decode the message at the other, at the other side. Okay, so um, can we be more economical than sending the message 10 times? Or what the, the note suggests is send each bit three times, right? So instead of sending 1011, I'll send 111000 one, 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 one. And then the receiver just breaks this up and then can just count to see within each of these triplets, what was the most, what was the more common digit or the most common digit, most common bit, I guess. And then de deduce it from there. But can we do better? Right. I think you could you could prove that if the, the probability of any single error is pretty small, that this will fairly reliably 
give your friend who's receiving the message um, with very high probability they will decode the correct message because the chance of getting two two errors on, on any one of these things is is, is small. Okay, and uh, one of the maybe the best known scheme for this is called the Hamming code. Okay, so here's just what the Hamming code does. Um, so if the Hamming code here, if we wish to transmit the string A B C D. Again, where these are bits, we instead transmit, and of course, like the person receiving the transmission knows that this is the scheme I'm using, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So I'm just adding three bits. And uh, what E is, is E is equal to A plus B plus C, mod two, of course, right? These are bits. F is A plus B plus D mod 2, and g equals a plus c plus d mod 2. Okay, so when you send your message, you send the message that you, to send the message a, b, c, d, you send it a, b, c, d, and then kind of like these three check bits. You send a plus b plus c, a plus b plus d, and a plus c plus d. Okay, so if v is that message we were interested in, 0, 1, 1, then what is w? So you send 1, 0, 1, 1. Then you send the sum of the first three. So the sum of the first three here is zero. Then you send the sum of one, two, and four. So that's also zero. And you send the sum of one, three, and four, and that's one in this case. Okay. Now, it turns out that this code, if there's only one, if there's zero or one error in the transmission, then using this code, uh, the receiver will be able to figure out where the error is and deduce the original message. And you're only adding three bits. So it's even better than sending the same message twice. Right, so I'm, instead of sending four, I'm sending seven. And this, the system can detect and correct one error in transmission. which means that as long as there's a very low probability of more than one error, this will reliably send every message so that your friend is able to receive co the correct message that you transmitted. And you use less than twice the number of bits as just sending sending the, the raw message. Okay, and in order to understand this, we will do some linear algebra over Z2. Okay, and that's, uh, that's just because you can think of these messages uh, like a seven bit string, you can think of as an element of Z two to the seven, right? You can think of this. as living inside of Z two to the seven. And then you have all the powers of linear algebra. Okay. So I'm going to make some definitions here. First definition, a code of length N is just any subset of z2 to the n. This so is just some collection of vectors, nothing special. Here's something a bit more special. A linear code is a subspace of z2 to the n. A subspace of z2 to the n. And we saw a little bit about what subspaces look like. The point is that this, just like in Math 308 or earlier in this course, a subspace will be closed under addition and closed under scalar multiplication. Of course, being closed under scalar multiplication over Z2 is very easy. It basically just means you contain the zero vector, right? <laughs> um, so now let's take a look at all possible uh, outputs of the Hamming code. In other words, all possible A, B, C, Ds. And then once you know A, B, C, and D, E, F, and G are forced. 
right? So you add the first three, then you add one, two, and four, and then you add one, three, and four. Okay, so what are the possibilities? So you can send zero, 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 and then three more zeros. Uh, you can send zero, 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 one, and then what are the uh, the three trailing bits? You add the first three, then you add one, two, and four, then you add one, three, and four. Right, that's what this says. You could send zero, zero, one, zero, then you add one, two, and three, one, two, and four, one, three, and four. Right. Uh, you can send zero, zero, one, one, add one, two, and three, one, two, and four, one, three, and four, etc. Okay, so you should actually do this. Um, there will, of course, be 16 things in here because the first four can be any of the 16 possible four-bit strings at the start. Once you've set the first four, the last three are, are, are fixed, right? So there's 16 elements. Okay, let's call this subset C. And now C is definitely a code because it's a subs it's a code of length seven. Because it's a subset of z to the seven. But it turns out it's more than that. It's actually a linear code. In other words, it turns out that it's a subspace of z two to the seven. And you can check this by checking every possible linear combination to see if you're closed. Of course, that's a bit tedious, um, but we also have other ways of thinking about subspaces from linear algebra, right? Again, if I give you a subspace over Rn, the way that you check it's a subspace usually isn't by checking every single possible linear combination because there's infinitely many of those things, right? The point is that you can express it as like a span or as a null space, and all that linear algebra still works over Z2. So, how do we how can we see that C is a linear code? Well, one one way we can do it is we can find a basis and then check to make sure we, we take every linear combination of the basis elements and see if we get C. Right? So suppose that G so this is one one way you can look for a basis is a k by n matrix whose rows form a basis of C. So if you can find a basis, then of course um, C will be every possible linear combination of the rows of G. Another way to say that is that C is equal to Y transpose G where y is any element in Z2k. This is all possible linear combination of the rows. So you multiply by a row vector on the left, every possible row vector. It, if this is the case, you say that G is a generator matrix for C. Okay, so in other words, what I'm saying is if you have a linear code, what a generator matrix is, is it's just you take the rows to be a basis of the linear code. Okay, so it turns out that you can do this for this example. Um, you can take the following three vectors. Notice I'm, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to make this thing have rank, rank four, right? Because I know that um, a four dimensional this thing has 16 elements, C, so if, it's going to be a four-dimensional subspace of Z2 to the 7. And so I need to make sure that I have four linearly independent rows. So this will make them linearly independent, and then the we know what the remaining entries of this matrix have to be because we know how to generate the last three entries of any vector in C. You had the first, you had the first three, then you had one, two, and four, then you had one, three, and four. You had the first three, then you had one, two, and four. You had one, three, and four. Then you had the first three, one, two, and four, one, three, and four. So this is, in fact, 
Uh, so check, you can check that C is all possible linear combinations of these rows. Right, there's only 16 possible linear combinations. You choose a zero or a one as a scalar in front of each of them, and then you'll see that you get exactly C. Okay, but we have linear algebra. We have even more linear algebra. So another way to think about this is by linear equations. Right, and the point is that if A, B, C, D, E, F is in C, then we know that A plus B plus uh, C equals E, and A plus B plus D equals F, and A, uh, sorry, what is this? A plus B plus C equals D. Uh, what, am I, what am I doing? I haven't added enough things. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. This is equal to E, this is equal to F, and A plus C plus D equals G. In other words, this set will be defined by a set of linear equations. And if it's defined by a set of linear equations, it means that it will be the null space of a certain matrix, which should mean that it's a subspace. All right, so in other words, C is defined by a set of linear equations. So C should equal the null space of some matrix. And if it's the null space of matrix, then it's got to be, um, it's got to be a subspace. And this is now really, this is going all the way back to the very first lecture of 308, <laughs> the set of solutions to a system of linear equations. Okay, uh, here's a nice trick, by the way. Over Z2, addition is the same thing as subtraction because one is plus and minus one are both the same element. So if you subtract over from one side, it's the same thing as adding. So these equations become, well, a plus b plus c minus e equals zero, but minus one is one and minus zero is zero. Plus and minus are the same thing in Z2. a plus b plus d plus f equals zero, a plus c plus d plus g equals zero. What is this saying? This is saying that if you multiply um, this is going to be three linear equations. So I'm going to have a matrix that has three rows in it. And what is this matrix saying? It's saying one, one, one. Okay, so this is the A, B, C, D, E, F, G columns. So one, 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 zero, one, zero, zero. 1, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. The set of vectors that satisfy these equations are exactly the same set of vectors that satisfy this equation. We're going all the way back to the beginning of undergrad linear algebra. We're converting a system of linear equations into a matrix equation. And that means that if I call this matrix P, C is equal to null space. OK, I said A. Let's call it A. C is equal to null space of A, and every null space is a subspace. Therefore, C is a subspace. OK, um, uh, I see why the notes call it P. This is called the parity check matrix of the code. OK. And this is very clear. I, don't, I now don't, don't need to do any computations. right? The point is that C is defined by these linear equations, which is the same thing as saying that C is the, the null space of this matrix. Null spaces are. Um, subspaces. In fact, the proof that you gave in 308 that null spaces are subspaces still works over any field. That's that's the, the, the beauty of being able to do linear algebra over any field. Okay, and the last thing for today, I want to introduce some coding theory terminology that will help us understand what I mean when I say that this 
system can can detect and correct one error. Okay. So this is the notion of the Hamming distance, which is a notion. It's a it's a metric of distance for these messages. So the Hamming distance. between two words u, v, in z to the n is just the number of uh, components where they differ. So you just count up the number of places where u and v have different entries. So d, the distance from u to v, is the size of the set of i's where ui is not equal to vi for one less or equal to i less or equal to n. You just count up the number of places where they're different, right? So you take this message we've been trying to send, and if you got this message, the distance between these two things is just one because they only differ in this third bit. Okay, and what the Hamming distance measures is how many flips it would take to get from one to the other, the minimum number of flips it would take to get from U to V. So this measures the number, the minimum number, right? You could of course do it in a stupid way of bit flips between u and v. And there's a very nice geometric way to think about what a bit flip is based on this hypercube picture, which let me just redraw. And let me even label it this time. Here's 0, 0, 0. I guess this will be my x-axis. Uh, I want to obey the right-hand rule, so let's make this my y-axis doesn't really matter, but one should always try to obey the right hand rule when one can. <laughs> zero, zero, one. Uh, one, zero, one. This here is one, sorry, zero, one, one. And this point here is one, zero, one. Right, and let me draw in the cube. And the thing to notice is that flipping a single bit just moves you in one of the orthogonal directions one unit, right? In other words, flipping a single bit just means walking along one of the edges of the cube, right? So if I'm at one, one, zero, if I flip the first bit, it's like moving over this way to this point. If I flip the second bit, it's like moving down to this point. If I flip the third bit, it's like moving outward to this point. So you can also think of the Hamming distance as the minimum number of steps to get from one corner of the unit cube to another by walking along the edges of the unit cube. Okay, so it's, this is also equal to the number uh, the minimum number of steps along the edges of the unit cube from u to v. Right? Because every time you change one bit, it's like walking along an edge. And this is like just a nice way to think about the distance between these things. Because if you have a distance, you should be able to visualize it as some kind of distance, right? Okay, uh, so uh, I might as well uh, right, make the next definition. So just, I only have a few minutes left, but let me just finish off the definition from the notes. So if C is a code, if C is a code, remember that's just a subset of Z to the N, 
then the minimum distance of C is the smallest distance between any two distinct words in C. Okay, so it's the min of the distance between u and v, where we're taking u not equal to v in C. You take all distinct words, you look at all of their differences, and um, then you take the smallest number, right? Because so if C contained one zero zero and zero zero zero, if it contained this, then this would imply that the distance of C is one. The distance is at so the minimum distance is at least one because to be zero means that you're the same vector. And I said we're gonna make sure that we only look over distinct vectors. Okay, and you should check, you should actually do this. I didn't do it for you. That if you take this Hamming code, this subset of z2 to the 7, that the minimum distance is actually 3. Which means, for example, that every single vector contains at least three ones, right? Because they are distance, at least distance 3 from 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, every non zero vector, okay? So you should check that if c is the Hamming code, in z2 to the 7, then the minimum distance is 3. OK, um, now the next definition is about correcting errors. But let me save that for next time, because we have to do another, another lecture on these error correcting codes anyway. For now, uh, the thing to take away from this lecture is just doing linear algebra over z2, this notion of Hamming distance and try to internalize this particular scheme, this Hamming code, where we're taking um, all the vectors that look like a, b, c, d, a plus b plus c, a plus b plus d, a plus c plus d. We'll see that it's a really, it's a really cool thing. All right, so another lecture on error correcting codes coming at you next time. See you then.